Well, good afternoon, all. We're going to continue on with our spinal cord injury lecture series. Today, I'll be speaking about bone metabolism after spinal cord injury. Maybe give me a thumbs up uh, so that I know you can hear me. Thank you. I appreciate it. So uh, <clears throat> that said, uh, let's talk through what, what we're going to be looking at. Um, it, essentially, I want to review normal bone metabolism, and then we'll talk about the um, etiologies uh, and, and why uh, bone loss is so profound after spinal cord injury. Um, and we'll talk about some potential treatment strategies and uh, relative efficacy of those strategies with the information that we have to date. Um, now this said, I also want to just uh, note that the um, Paralyzed Veterans of America uh, consortium guidelines um, have been updated to include bone health. Uh, that document um, has been written in and is currently under review. So I'm not allowed to share materials uh, from that document just yet, but within the next six months, we anticipate uh, that there will be guidelines with regard to bone health. And so I'm not including everything in here because some of that um, I've, I've been asked not to put forward yet, but we'll have some new guidelines within the next six months. Um, so let's start off with the composition of bone. Recognize that bone um, is a dynamic mineralized connective tissue. Um, we have to realize that what we see when we look at uh, skeletons in the anatomy lab, when we look at the skeletons that we find on, on posters and whatnot, it, it doesn't really reflect uh, the true um, connective tissue and the dynamic properties of bone. Uh, in, in living bone, uh, there are osteocytes, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, significant blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. Um, and so bone is very much a, a, a dynamic organ. Its function is to provide rigidity, shape, protection, and support for body structures, and uh, specifically for uh, mobility. Um, so as we consider the uh, skeletal composition, um, generally we can classify bones as uh, um, flat or long bones if we consider just from a mechanical standpoint. So the flat bones, those in the skull, the scapula and the ilium, uh, whereas the long bones are considered uh, humerus, femur and tibia. We could also look at bone uh, from a histological standpoint and that would be um, uh, characterizing cortical or compact bone, which is what we find at the long bone shafts and at the flat bone surfaces, as well as trabecular or cancellous bone, uh, which is what we find at the long bone ends and uh, with the inner flat bones. And so that said, um, let's talk through what cortical bone uh, looks like, uh, recognizing that in the outer surface, you have the periosteum, and then uh, within you have the endosteum. The endosteum uh, is uh, including concentric rings or lamella of a bone matrix around central tubes that um, run uh, lengthwise through the bones. These are called haversion canals, and within those canals, uh, there are the blood vessels, the lymphatics, the nerves, and the connective tissue. So these concentric rings, the lamellae, are arranged concentrically, and uh, they can withstand perpendicular force uh, to a large extent. So this, this represents cortical bone. Cortical bone is approximately, makes up 75% of the total bone uh, within the human body. Trabecular bone, on the other hand, uh, is, uh, makes up the other quarter. Um, it has this honeycomb arrangement uh, with a number of interconnecting plates and bars we call trabecula. Um, and those uh, lie around the marrow itself. Uh, recognize that this honeycomb is uh, collagen arranged in parallel. And so this allows us to withstand compressive forces uh, without significant uh, fracture. Bone is, did I mention dynamic? So it is constantly undergoing 
a, a breaking down and a building up. The building up process is called anabolism um, and is a result of osteoblastic activity. Blasts build is an easy way to remember that. Um, the osteoblasts originate from mesenchymal cells and on the surface they have a receptor activator of nuclear factor 6b ligand, so rankle. Um, they also produce um, osteoprotegerin, uh, osteoprotegerin. I have to keep practicing how to say that, uh, receptors which neutralize rankle. Uh, and so the bottom line is with rankle neutralized, uh, this allows for the creation of new bone osteoblastic activity. On the other hand, if you don't have a significant amount of osteoprotegerin, um, basically then the uh, rank receptors on the osteoclasts uh, are activated and you see an increase in osteoclastic activity. So we realize that bone has multicellular units, uh, the basic multicellular unit, BMU, um, is comprised of osteoblasts, which secrete osteoid, and therefore you have the new bone formation. Um, the BMU also includes the osteoclasts. Those remove the old bone through a process of acidification and proteolytic digestion. Um, osteocytes um, are actually mechanoreceptors and they respond to forces um, whether those are uh, applied endwise or perpendicular to the bone, um, the mechanoreceptors uh, provide for the building of bone in specific regions of stress. Um, you also have within the BMU capillaries, nerves, and connective tissue. So if you break a bone, it's going to hurt. Um, if you, uh, and it's going to take a while for those nerves to. Uh, regenerate after a bone has been broken. And so it will continue to hurt for some time. Um, so as we talk about bone remodeling, we recognize that uh, the remodeling process is gonna be influenced by mechanical loading. Um, and that may include stresses and strains. Um, it's going to be influenced by the hormonal milieu. Certain hormones that we're gonna talk through um, have the, uh, the ability to either increase or decrease uh, bone remodeling. Um, the, the bone remodeling process is also influenced by neuromodulation. Um, and so if you have, for example, a spinal cord injury and you lose neural input to the bone, that is also going to change the remodeling process. And then pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as we see with um, Oh, I don't know, obesity. Obesity, remember, uh, you have this a, uh, um, from the adipose tissue release of pro-inflammatory cytokines that actually stimulate osteoclastic activity. And so all of these things can influence bone remodeling and all of these things are sig significantly and also profoundly affected after a spinal cord injury. So as we take those one at a time, let's consider mechanical loading um, so stress, strange, strain, and longitudinal loading on the bone um, is going to build bone according to Wolf's Law. Now, Wolf's Law back in 1894 um, talked about these stresses and strains are going to change the shape of the bone to accommodate the stresses and strains in those particular areas. Increasing osteoblastic activity where you have longitudinal loading um, but also where you have bone stresses because of muscle uh, contraction, for example. Um, and then osteoclastic activity is going to occur um, in those areas with least um, stresses and strains. Now, those stresses and strains can be in the form of compression, tension, torsion, or shear um, as you come through there. So in addition to mechanical loading, we talked about the uh, influence of hormones on, uh, on bone composition. Um, number of hormones you're familiar with, uh, we're gonna talk through vitamin D, uh, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, testosterone, estrogen, growth hormone, and glucocorticoids. 
Um, some of these are anabolic and some of them are catabolic. Um, and so as we consider uh, the hormonal milieu, uh, we have to especially consider calcium metabolism. Um, now remember that most of our body's calcium is stored in bone. 95% of the total calcium in your body is actually stored in uh, bone. Um, some is uh, intracellular, some is protein bound within the plasma. Um, and we know that we increase calcium storage through the, uh, these hormonal influences, calcitonin, testosterone, estrogen, and growth hormone, all of these are anabolic hormones. And so that's gonna increase calcium storage. We also have to recognize, however, that the body needs calcium for blood coagulation, for muscle contraction and nerve function. And so as necessary, um, we can increase the free calcium uh, that can be used for these uh, um, types of mechanisms um, by uh, calcitriol or D3. I'll talk you through this in a moment. Parathyroid hormone and glucocorticoids. All of these are, are catabolic uh, for bone um, and will increase free calcium uh, at the expense of taking calcium from the bones themselves. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. Remember A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble. Um, sources of vitamin D from foods and supplements, uh, fortified milk, for example, um, but uh, ultraviolet light triggers synthesis in skin. So if you wanna go out today, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's a little bit rainy and cloudy today. It's not the best day to get uh, ultraviolet light, um, but when you have plenty of, of sunshine uh, directly on as we do in, in Miami most days, that's going to trigger the synthesis in the skin uh, to formulate vitamin D. Now vitamin D is hydroxylated by the liver, meaning you add a, a hydroxyl group to it and it becomes 25 hydroxy vitamin D or calcium diol, um, and then further uh, hydroxylated in the kidneys to form uh, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D or calcitriol. So uh, generally, this is going to increase calcium absorption uh, in the gut. Now, if your plasma concentrations of calcium are high, you're going to see a reduction in calcitriol. If your calcium concentration in plasma is low, you're gonna increase calcitriol. So parathyroid uh, hormone is another hormone uh, that we um, talk about uh, breaking bone down. So basically parathyroid is secreted by the parathyroid chief cells um, and it activates osteoclasts to break bone down. That's going to free calcium in the process. You're also going to see in, uh, in response to parathyroid uh, hormone, a resorption of calcium at the distal tubules at the kidney. Um, and parathyroid hormone also stimulates the for formation of calcitriol at the kidneys. So um, basically these are going to increase your plasma concentration of uh, calcium. Um, if you have elevated calcium concentration, uh, in the plasma, that's going to inhibit, so it's a negative feedback on parathyroid hormone secretion. Um, and subsequently, you're gonna see a reduction in calcium uh, at the kidney and gut and decreased bone resorption uh, under those circumstances. Calcitonin is another uh, hormone uh, intimately involved with the, uh, the storage of um, uh, calcium within bones. And so this is secreted by the thyroid, not parathyroid, by the thyroid parafollicular C cells. So calcitonin inhibits osteoclasts and it reduces bone resorption. So you see an increased renal tubular excretion of calcium in this uh, scenario. Additional bone hormones of note include estrogen, testosterone, and growth hormone, all of which are anabolic or bone building. Um, and then an additional catabolic bone 
uh, hormone are, are the glucocorticoids. So they actually stimulate osteoclastic activity um, and uh, result into bone wasting. So that, this is uh, you know, related to the um, hormonal milieu that we're looking at. So what are the influences of a spinal cord injury um, on bone? We see a reduction in mechanical loading um, and ultimately, um, so particularly with our young healthy males who then sustain a spinal cord injury, most of them are at peak bone mass, kind of between the ages of 18 and 25. If they sustain a spinal cord injury at that time, um, it is very likely they will develop a mobilization hypercalcemia. We'll talk through that uh, in a little bit, um, but without mechanically loading those bones, um, these folks are gonna be dumping calcium from the bones very, very quickly. Um, we also see a reduction in anabolic hormones uh, initially and then ongoing uh, for men at least, we're gonna see a reduction in testosterone and growth hormone. Women during the initial phase may have a reduction in estrogen, but most women are going to resume their uh, usual menstrual cycle within um, three to six months. Um, and so uh, they are not quite as um, uh, at risk, surprisingly, as men, young men, uh, during uh, the subsequent follow-up after spinal cord injury. So we also see changes in parathyroid uh, hormone and calcitonin, uh, which lend themselves to um, bone breakdown. Uh, the neuronal changes that we see after a spinal cord injury, remember you have a blunted sympathetic nervous system. Um, and so your motor, motor units uh, are, are going to decrease adrenergic receptors within the bones. Um, the sympathetic blunting also decreases vascular perfusion to the bones. Um, and then uh, intermittent bouts of autonomic dysreflexia where you have these intermittent bursts of sympathetic uh, nervous system activity also stimulates osteoclasts, which causes bone breakdown. So ultimately you see decrease afferent signal conduction and um, this combination of features uh, also causes bone resorption or bone loss. And then we've mentioned before obesity related cytokines, particularly IL-1, IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of these obesity-related cytokines are known to stimulate osteoclastic activity. Now, many people who don't have a spinal cord injury who are obese um, are able to offset the inflammatory uh, nature of the cytokines and the osteoclastic activity because of the mechanical loading associated with their increased body weight. And so we don't typically see um, osteoporosis penia osteoporosis in able-bodied individuals who are still mobile, uh, who are still walking. Um, however, uh, when you stop loading the bones uh, and they uh, have high levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, you're more likely to see increased osteoclastic activity and some bone loss uh, during that time. So uh, there's actually a, a very nice um, demonstration of why people with spinal cord injury have osteoporosis. It includes all of the things that I've just mentioned. Uh, Jang in clinical endocrinology in 2006 put this forward and we've been following ever since, but we realized that the bone loss after spinal cord injury is much more profound uh, than uh, we would see in non-spinal cord injured adults. Um, Osteoporosis, what is that? Um, so this is the condition of a reduction in bone mass resulting in an increased porosity. So uh, basically instead of having a nice healthy bone with a lot of calcium phosphorus in it, you see in osteoporosis and severe osteoporosis, a very, very brittle bone, very porous bone. And that reflects a reduction in bone calcium and bone protein. The World Health Organization definitions for osteopenia and osteoporosis are listed here. Osteopenia is uh, bone mineral density that is less than two and a half standard deviations below normal 
of young Caucasian women. This is what it's based on. Um, osteoporosis is when you have more than two and a half standard deviations um, below normal, below bone mineral density. Um, that would be expected in normal young Caucasian women. Um, so I wanna talk through the, uh, the potential causes besides spinal cord injury and the features that I talked about, things to consider um, if you're working up somebody with osteoporosis, uh, you're gonna be wanting to look at uh, blood or serum laboratories, including CBC, including uh, the chemistries, liver function tests, thyroid function tests, vitamin D levels, parathyroid hormone and other hormone levels, uh, bone turnover uh, markers, um, and so the resorption markers that we typically look at, CTX or C telepeptide, and urinary N telepeptide or NTX, these are uh, bone resorption markers that indi indicate that you've got increased osteoclastic activity going on. Um, and then the bone formation <laughs> markers include bone specific alkaline phosphatase, BSAP, osteocalcin. Um, OC and amino termini, terminal, I'm sorry, propeptide of type one procollagen. So these are, are the different markers that we look at. When you see a, uh, a ratio between those that indicate you've got more resorptive uh, markers, obviously that means you've got osteoclastic activity and your bones are gonna be uh, becoming more and more brittle as that occurs. Um, they look at a number of other uh, labs, including urinary labs as you go through the process. Um, and then we look at imaging studies and primarily we use dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, um, which has a relatively uh, low dose of radiation uh, per study. Um, for a whole body scan, um, the, uh, the amount of radiation that a person is exposed to uh, is uh, about the same as if you were to fly from Miami to San Francisco. Uh, did you know that you're receiving radiation as you do that flight uh, going across there? It's not a great amount is, is what I'm saying. And so generally speaking, DEXA is very, very safe. Um, we're not gonna do a whole body scan typically to look uh, for osteoporosis and spinal cord injury. We're gonna take very specific uh, metrics, uh, particularly at the, uh, the femoral neck, um, at the distal femur and the proximal tibia. Uh, those are particularly high risk areas for persons with uh, spinal cord injury um, for fractures. So um, dual x-ray, uh, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry basically uh, reports out T-scores and Z-scores. So the T-score is the number of standard deviations below average for young, healthy adult women. So again, normal uh, um, T-scores are gonna be uh, less, they're gonna be greater than negative one. Uh, so uh, basically if we're looking at these areas here, um, if this is normal, um, as we look at normal through here a, uh, with regard to bone mineral density, one standard deviation would be listed here. Two standard deviations are gonna be twice that. So you've got your normal bone mass um, and you want to consider those folks who are at risk, uh, that is those who have osteopenia, um, have T-scores um, between negative one and negative two and a half standard deviations below normal. Uh, those with osteoporosis are gonna have T-scores less than, I'm sorry, that are gonna be lower than, so they're gonna be down here in this range. Um, I should say more than two and a half standard deviations below uh, normal is considered osteoporotic. Um, other imaging um, uh, apparatus that we can use include ultrasounds and then quantitative uh, computed tomography or, or quantitative CT. Um, we don't have as much data yet on ultrasound. We have a fair amount of data on quantitative CT, but the radiation dose associated with quantitative CT is, um, is generally frowned upon, at least in a clinical setting. In research settings, 
Uh, it's allowing us to be able to take a look and make some ideas uh, moving forward. Generally speaking, uh, it's recommended that folks uh, undergo uh, a DEXA scan um, every one to two years. I'm sorry, these are the new guidelines that I'm not supposed to be speaking to yet. Um, so uh, up, up to this point, let me just say this, there have not been guidelines for um, if you should get DEXA scans in persons with spinal cord injury um, and how frequently you should get DEXA scans and what do you do if you find folks who are osteopenic or osteoporotic. Uh, we have not had specific guidelines and like I said, those are gonna be coming forward within the next six months. We've reported out uh, some time ago, if you look at the relationship between um, regional bone density measurements, uh, and so specifically looking at arms, looking at legs, and looking at trunk compared to um, able-bodied uh, uh, young Caucasian women references. Um, when you look at time since injury, there is a very uh, clear relationship as we look at adults. Now, if you look at folks with paraplegia, it's very likely that their upper extremity bone mineral density will be higher than normal. Uh, so those with paraplegia are gonna be propelling their wheelchairs using their upper extremity for transfers, and they will actually have a higher uh, bone mineral density, particularly at the radius, than you would see in able-bodied individuals, including yourselves, um, because they are um, undergoing mechanical loading to a much greater extent than you or I typically would with regard to their upper extremities. Um, on the other hand, if you, so, so this is what you would typically see with somebody with paraplegia. Uh, they would be well above uh, normal. Um, on the other hand, or I should say the other leg, um, their legs are going to be significantly osteoporotic um, and well uh, below the standard deviation, more, well below two and a half standard deviations below normal. Um, and so uh, that's not unusual. Recognize that, that this, um, this degree of bone mineral loss um, puts them right at fracture thresholds. Uh, and then they kind of plateau right there at fracture thresholds. So the body doesn't keep tissue that it doesn't need. Um, if it's right at fracture threshold, but you're not loading or um, um, moving that limb, the body won't dump more than it, than it needs to dump, um, but you're gonna continue to stay at fracture threshold unless you change mechanical loading, the hormonal milieu, the neural uh, stimulation and or the adiposity. Um, and then the trunk, uh, you, at least in, in our group of folks, uh, was a little bit higher than normal, which is not unusual as we consider two things. Number one, Many of these folks after a spinal cord injury will have a fusion, uh, and that may be bone and or instrumented fusion. Um, but the other thing is that many of our folks, uh, particularly high para and, um, and tetraplegia, um, those folks as they are, are going through the environment will have a lot of uh, loading on their spine as they go over little bumps, et cetera, et cetera. And so they have that constant pounding to the spine. And it's not unusual to see folks who are, you know, more than five years out, particularly if you look at the spine films of people who are 10 years out and beyond, they will look as if they have dish. That is, they have bamboo um, type of spine that you would see uh, in, uh, in, for example, ankylosing spondylitis. And it's because of the constant pounding and the osteophytic uh, progression that occurs in the trunk, um, they don't have the musculature to dampen uh, the effects of the vibration that they, they experience. Um, so what are the risk factors for osteoporosis? Um, sorry, ladies, but this is, this is just the reality. Uh, women generally don't uh, develop as high a total bone mineral content as men. Um, and part of that is uh, because body weight is less, generally speaking, than men. Um, and the mechanical loading on their bones is generally less. So usually women um, are, have smaller stature 
with less total bone mineral content. Um, and so they are at risk of losing more bone, um, particularly as they age and as they go through menopause. Um, so advancing age for all of us as we age, um, the hormonal milieu changes somewhat um, and we also become less active. And so that reduces our, our mechanical loading of the bone. So you have a, a double whammy there as you have less anabolic hormones and less mechanical loading. Uh, Caucasians and Asians uh, generally are at higher risk, uh, for example, than, than blacks who have a high bone mineral density, approximately 5% greater than um, Caucasians and Asians of the same um, body weight, height, and, um, uh, and stature. Um, those with thin, small frames are going to be at higher risk for osteoporosis because, again, they just don't have the bone mineral content that you or I would have. Those with a sedentary lifestyle, estrogen deficiency and or testosterone deficiency. Those with eating disorders, uh, cigarette smoking and excess of alcohol use are going to be at higher risk. And particularly those with spinal cord injury. So how do you treat it? We could mechanically load, we could provide um, calcium, vitamin D, and hormonal replacement. We could provide bisphosphonates. Um, is that going to be sufficient? So the mechanical loading we're going to talk through, but basically could be in the form of standing frame, assistive walking, vibration, and, and functional electrical stimulation. Um, we've uh, seen data uh, when we tried to do uh, a standing frame, uh, this is a, a passive standing process. Um, and uh, Ben et al. in 2005 demonstrated no significant change in the femur bone mineral density. Uh, De Bruin and Alecna showed that they could reduce bone loss, but you're still gonna lose bone. Um, and um, the, uh, the results uh, if you were standing, you would only lose 25% of your bone mineral density um, over two years. Um, if you weren't standing, you would lose approximately a third of your bone mineral density over two years. Um, and that, uh, while statistically significant, it's not clear that it is clinically uh, significant. So with regard to, uh, and this is in the acute, uh, acute phase. Chronically, passive standing uh, is not adequate to prevent lower extremity osteoporosis. Um, so the, the other thing that we don't, well, we do know, um, but basically uh, these studies show that you can reduce acutely, you can reduce bone loss, but um, with, with some standing, but um, as soon as you stop standing for any period of time, the bone will uh, go back to its usual state of losing, losing, losing bone mineral content um, uh, or bone mineral density um, until it achieves right at fracture threshold again. So which is about two thirds normal of uh, bone mineral density so that you know. What about assisted walking? Um, there are some studies that have been done looking at uh, loading uh, with assisted walking. Um, Needham Shropshire in 1997, uh, they were using the Peristep device, which is a combination of uh, uh, surface functional electrical stimulation and orthotics. Didn't show any significant increase in lower uh, extremity bone mineral density in persons with chronic uh, paraplegia. Gian Gregorio in 2006 uh, looked at body weight supported treadmill training three times a week. Uh, for 48 weeks, um, so almost a year, demonstrated no significant increase in lower extremity bone mineral density. And Kaplan in 1978 uh, reported early ambulation appeared to reduce hypercalcuria and improve calcium balance, but they didn't assess bone mineral density. Why not? Well, in 1978, we didn't have DEXA or CT scans. And so uh, we didn't have the imaging uh, that would be necessary at that point. Vibration plates are continuing to be assessed. And again, will be addressed to some extent in the consortium guidelines when those come out. Um, but it, uh, 
it would appear that this might be a way to reduce, uh, at least in the acute setting, to reduce bone loss. However, if you stop using the vibration plates, then the bone is going to, again, drop uh, its bone mineral density, particularly in the lower extremities, to about two thirds of normal, which is right at fracture threshold. Electrical stimulation. Um, Acutely, it's unclear, uh, but it may reduce bone loss. It is not able to increase bone loss in the acute phase. Um, electrical stimulation, looking at particularly functional electrical stimulation, leg cycle ergometry. Um, in chronic individuals, uh, Bedell, uh, Bloomfield, and Leeds uh, showed that they could maintain the bone mineral density at the femoral neck compared to placebo. Um, but again, once they stopped, uh, these folks went, uh, went on and continued to lose bone um, uh, to bring the bone back to about two thirds normal, which is at fracture threshold. Uh, Bloomfield reported uh, increased bone mineral density at the distal femur, uh, where the quadriceps muscles are um, basically exerting their influence on bone. Um, and uh, Moore report, reported a, uh, a slight increase in bone mineral density at the proximal tibia um, and or at least maintaining bone mineral density at the proximal tibia. But again, once they stopped training, these folks uh, went back to fracture thresholds uh, with regard to lower extremities. So the clinical significance of this uh, functional electrical stimulation, leg cycle ergometry at least, uh, uh, remains unclear. It appears that it may be helpful, um, but as soon as you stop training, it's just like muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. Um, and so uh, we need to keep looking at that. So how do we manage osteopenia, osteoporosis in the able-bodied population? Um, there are a number of things that we've looked at, including uh, providing adequate calcium and vitamin D regular weight bearing um, and muscle strengthening exercises, fall preventions, tobacco cessation, and then uh, avoidance of excess alcohol intake. Um, let's talk through some of the drugs uh, that are used for managing osteoporosis, uh, including the bisphosphonates, calcitonin, estrogen and, and hormonal treatments, uh, estrogen agonist slash antagonist, we'll talk through a little bit, the tissue selective estrogen complexes. So this is the conjugated estrogen and the, the combination of that with estrogen agonists antagonists. Parathyroid hormone, um, and then these um, rank and rankle uh, inhibitors. So um, just talking our way through these, the bisphosphonates uh, basically work uh, by um, binding to the osteoclasts and inhibiting the resorption uh, that goes along with those. The first generation was a um, which we don't see uh, used much anymore. The second generation bisphosphonates actually include an amine or amino group um, at the terminal region. We've seen a number of these developed um, over time. And basically the more recent uh, zoledronate is uh, 10,000 times more effective than the original etidronate was. Um, and uh, as such, they only need to provide it once a year, IV. We'll talk through the uh, flu-like side effects associated with all of these. But um, if you could uh, give a person one dose a year and be able to maintain bone mineral density, how great would that be? Um, that would be really wonderful. Um, before zoledronate, there have been a number of things that have come along. Pamidronate, uh, we have some studies looking at it, uh, provided IV once a month. Aledronate, um, which you can take uh, by mouth uh, one time a, a week, has 500 times the um, efficacy of etidronate. Uh, Ibadronate, a thousand times uh, the effectiveness of etidronate. Um, and again, taking one dose a month or IV every three months, um, and then resedronate. Uh, again, um, only one fifth as uh, efficacious as zoledronate, but 2,000 times more effective than etidronate. And uh, 
just taking one tablet a month uh, appears effective in the able-bodied population. What about the spinal cord injury? Um, we, we have more studies than this, actually. I didn't include them because of this uh, recent uh, update in the uh, bone health guidelines put forward by the consortium, but this gives you an idea of uh, what those are showing. Basically, um, uh, Moran de Brito showed with alledronate 10 milligrams uh, a day versus control for six months only two of 12 parameters when you looked at whole body DEXA scans significantly improved. Um, and so there were 10 parameters that would put people at significant risk for fractures. Uh, Bill Bauman and crew uh, up at the Bronx VA in New York City um, in 2005 looked at 11 individuals provided pamidronate IV versus uh, placebo. Um, and this was provided at one, two, three, six, nine, and 12 months, um, failed to significantly reduce bone loss uh, in these uh, individuals. Gilcrest, a few years later, took 31 individuals um, using Ledronate, 70 milligrams PO per week versus placebo. Um, and they started treatment within 10 days of the spinal cord injury, provided it for 12 months. They showed 17% less uh, bone mineral uh, content loss um, than compared to placebo. So, and yet, uh, as they stopped this, it's expected that folks would move right on to uh, develop bone loss to the point of uh, fracture threshold. Um, again, in non spinal cord injury individuals, there have been studies that have shown significant uh, reduction in bone loss um, and a significant reduction in fractures uh, over time um, in able-bodied individuals. The, the difficulty with looking at bone fractures as, as an outcome is if you're not using your legs, if you're not standing on your legs, uh, what, are, what is the likelihood that you would have a fracture? So that becomes related to falls, for example, um, and or moving individuals. So I think I've shared this uh, with some of you before, but back in the day as they were uh, doing functional electrical stimulation with Christopher Reeve to try to increase muscle mass and bone uh, mass in his lower extremities, um, it appeared uh, that it was somewhat helpful, but he actually developed a fracture um, related to FES leg cycle ergometry or not, actually. The fracture that occurred, occurred when they were moving him off of the, uh, the bicycle um, and the weight of his leg caused a fracture at his femur. Um, so recognize when we're talking about uh, bone mineral content that is two thirds normal right at the fracture threshold, the, the weight of the limb itself can cause a fracture, uh, which is I, uh, again, not something that you, you and I would typically see in an able-bodied population. So calcitonin in the non-spinal cord injured population um, has been demonstrated to reduce vertebral fractures in those with previous fractures, um, but does have some side effects. Um, we are still looking uh, to see if it's going to be effective as a long-term treatment, but probably not because of the the uh, side effects uh, for folks with spinal cord injury. Um, there are recommendations for uh, um, supplementation of calcium and vitamin D, particularly for those at, at, at risk. So uh, one to two grams per day of calcium is recommended um, and 400 to 2000 units per day of vitamin D. Uh, Bill Bauman, again, his uh, study in 2005, they looked at um, vitamin D analogs uh, provided for two years in persons with chronic spinal cord injury. Um, compared to placebo, uh, they saw a bone mineral density in the lower extremities increase um, statistically, but it was unclear that this was of clinical significance uh, because they started out at two thirds uh, normal bone mineral content in the lower extremities. Um, so, uh, we, we still don't know exactly what we should be doing. 
Um, estrogen and hormone therapy in non-spinal cord injured individuals, uh, women in particular. Uh, there are a number of different names for these um, uh, hormonal therapies. Um, recognize that uh, uh, oral and transdermal estrogen, progestin, and combination uh, have been demonstrated in able-bodied population, non-spinal cord injured individuals, to reduce vertebral and hip fractures by a third um, and to reduce other osteoporotic fractures by approximately 25%. Um, again, unclear in our persons with spinal cord injury. Um, the estrogen antagonists and agonist combinations, basically, um, so Evista or Riloxifene, uh, have decreased vertebral fractures if the person had had a prior fracture by approximately a third. Um, and about 50% reduction in vertebral fractures if they hadn't had a prior fracture but were at risk. Um, the side effects, uh, DVT risk um, is similar to that of estrogen. Um, again, in the non-spinal cord injured population, looking at conjugated estrogen plus the estrogen agonist antagonists. Uh, so Dwavi, uh, basically they've shown an increase in lumbar spine bone mineral density uh, by approximately 1.5% um, and 1.2% in increased uh, bone mineral density at the hip over a period of 12 months. Uh, significant side effects associated with these medications. Um, to my knowledge, they, these have not been trialed in persons with spinal cord injury. Parathyroid hormone, so um, the uh, teraparatides, um, um, has received some recent investigation in spinal cord injury. I think those trials are ongoing, um, but in non-spinal cord injured individuals, they've shown a reduction of 65% in vertebral fractures, 50% in non-vertebral fragility fractures over a period of two years. Um, side effects, however, included leg cramps, nausea, and dizziness. Um, and again, the uh, the trials have shown that if you follow this uh, two-year treatment with bisphosphonate, uh, you can further increase bone mineral density in non-spinal cord injured uh, individuals. I, I, again, I think the trials are ongoing in persons with spinal cord injury. We have uh, rankle, rank rankle inhibitors, uh, basically. Uh, so denosumab, um, and again, this is 60 milligrams uh, injected subcutaneously every six months with two thirds uh, reduction in vertebral fractures, 40% reduction in hip fractures and 20% um, reduction in non-vertebral fractures over a three year period in non-spinal cord injured uh, adults. Uh, these are the side effects, uh, including osteonecrosis of the jaw. There are a number of non-FDA uh, approved drugs that uh, are being trialed um, in both uh, able-bodied as well as uh, spinal cord injured individuals. Um, I don't have an update on those uh, trials at this point. So, so generally speaking, we see um, osteoporosis and spinal cord injury occurring at a, at a profound rate. Um, and it's because uh, there is a combination of mechanical unloading, hormonal deficiency, impaired neural signaling, and obesity-related cytokines in this population. You don't, I mean, you might see two of these occurring in able-bodied individuals, uh, depending upon activity levels and whatnot, but to have all four of these occurring um, after spinal cord injury really puts them at uh, a profound rate of osteoporosis in the lower extremities. Um, so there are some guidelines uh, that will be coming out. I'm not allowed to speak to those just yet, um, but uh, in the future, probably optimal treatments are going to require some combination of mechanical loading, vitamin D and calcium supplementation, bisphosphonates and obesity uh, reduction. Just one other thing of note before I finish, immobilization hypercalcema I mentioned, especially uh, we see this in young um, uh, adolescent or early adult uh, men. Uh, 
who have sustained a spinal cord injury and start dumping calcium very, very quickly. Uh, they're going to have elevated uh, ionized calcium levels as well. Um, and uh, the uh, typical uh, scenario of bones, moans, and psychic groans associated with this, that's the symptoms that they will be recording. Um, and essentially what we need to do is to flush out this extra calcium um, by providing uh, Lasix that is furosemide uh, and normal saline and consider using pomidronate uh, during that first uh, 24 hours. Heterotopic ossification also occurs uh, more likely as you have significant spasticity around the hips and knees. Um, and uh, etidronate, if you can get it, um, is the uh, recommended uh, treatment, 20 milligrams per kilo per day, but it's hard to find this medication anymore. And so oftentimes we're left with just using, at this point, um, still uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, to try to reduce the heterotopic ossification. Remember, that's normal bone in abnormal places. Uh, so in spinal cord injury, you see that particularly in the hips, knees, and then the shoulders uh, and elbows less frequently. So these are my references. Uh, I don't have a lot of time left for questions, but I do have a few minutes. Would be happy to take uh, questions um, or if you have thoughts uh, that you would like to share, feel, feel free. Hmm, a lot to think about. Any questions, additional thoughts? I think, I think we're going to continue to have, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities to look at multiple interventions uh, in combination. Um, and that, uh, that likely will uh, be what the recommendations from the consortium guidelines are, are going to say as well. But I'm not really supposed to speak to that just yet. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Um, we'll uh, continue the spinal cord injury lecture series within the next week or two. Everybody have a wonderful week um, and uh, bone up on your physiology. Take care. <laughs>